In the news this week is the start of our dystopian doom. NVIDIA is being accused of anti-competitive practices. Also, the MSI claw gets a price. AMD's RX 7700 XT GPU drops in price, and actually so did the 4070 and the 4070 Super this past week or two, so that's been good news. Uh, Sony lays off 900 people from its game divisions, and Larian Studios speaks up about hiring and a couple of other topics from the past week. Before that, this video is brought to you by Arctic and the Liquid Freezer 3, which we've tested using our standard methodology and found to be one of the most noise-efficient CPU coolers on our charts. The Liquid Freezer 3 includes rise and offset mounting to improve AMD performance and uses a thicker radiator to further lower the temperatures. Arctic has priced these competitively for AIOs, and you can learn more at the link in the description below. This one is quick, just a GN store update. We just added these hoodies to the store this past week with the 7900 GRE review, actually, that we posted. You check that out if you missed that review. Uh, but it's up on store.gamersnexus.net if you want to grab it. They've been super popular so far, so thanks to everyone who's picked one up following that review we posted. And the hoodies use a tri-blend material, soft interior, and quality fabrics. We've been working hard at in-depth testing lately, particularly with the ATX case test bench revamp that you'll see actually debut next week, and with handheld gaming devices. So this note is just here to say thank you for those who have picked it up, and if you want to help support the work we're doing, like with our in-depth testing that, I don't know if the Legion Go will be live when this goes up, probably not, but it's next, then you can go over to store.gamersexus.net, grab one of these or any of the other items, and it directly funds our uh, increasingly expensive testing efforts, but it's really cool the stuff we're doing these days. I love working on the handhelds actually specifically because it's something a little new. We get to build a new methodology around it, and it's actually causing some new thoughts going into some of the older component methodologies we do, like with the ATX cases that we're revisiting. Uh, so having something new is helping out with that. But anyway, you can also go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you want to throw a few bucks to us that way instead. Up first, NVIDIA is being accused of allegedly engaging in anti-competitive practices. This comes from a report from the Wall Street Journal, which uh, says that it's gating access or could be uh, acting in a retaliatory way if AI partners in the industry speak to competitors of NVIDIA for their AI GPU supply. And NVIDIA currently does power the overwhelming majority of anything related to deep learning, machine learning, uh, inference, and uh, AI in general as a kind of a catch-all phrase in the industry right now to the extent that obtaining a GPU geared towards any of these tasks can be an extensively long process due to the wait lists that arise from limited supply and suppliers available. According to Grok CEO Jonathan Ross, this is made more arduous if NVIDIA knows that you're engaging with its competitors. Ross told the Wall Street Journal, quote, a lot of people we meet with say that if NVIDIA were to hear that we were meeting, they would disavow it. The problem is that you have to pay NVIDIA a year in advance, and you may get your hardware in a year, or it may take longer. And it's, uh, quote, aw shucks, you're buying from someone else. And I guess it's going to take a little longer. Now, it's not news that NVIDIA being such a dominant leader in the market has made people uneasy. The Wall Street Journal previously reported that OpenAI CEO Sam Altman is seeking to raise $7 trillion to reshape the semiconductor landscape, which is no doubt, at least in part, due to NVIDIA's dominance. Now, actually, if you're curious in how the rest of the industry views this, I've been in discussions with basically every type of manufacturer about NVIDIA at some point, whether they make GPUs or not. And uh, one of the recent examples was a case manufacturer which told us that their launches are somewhat dictated by NVIDIA's launches, even though they only make computer cases and some other unrelated components to video cards. And so they are effectively totally agnostic to the GPU market. But the reason that the GPU launches from NVIDIA specifically still impact their release schedule as a case manufacturer uh, is simply because if NVIDIA chooses not to release a new architecture for an extended period of time, like between the 40 and supposedly the 50 series, uh, which is what we're seeing right now, then that affects whether they want to launch their case this year or if they want to wait to align with the 50 series launch where they're going to see higher initial sales and potentially more success at the risk of launching the product later, which has different kind of knock-on impact. So NVIDIA, in one way or the other, does have direct or indirect, in this case, dictation of other aspects of the industry. Uh, and the, the industry does somewhat march to NVIDIA's schedule, whether the rest of the parties involved want to or not. So this is not news, that aspect of it. Uh, and until AMD 
or Intel can break rank from that, it's going to stay that way. Or until Nvidia, at least in the gaming market, decides it doesn't really care about that segment anymore and forsakes it in some capacity. Uh, what is news here is the specific conversation about the AI aspect of the industry. So uh, recently we reported that Microsoft would be working with Intel Foundry, which Intel bills as, quote, the world's first systems foundry for the AI era, end quote. This would be to manufacture an upcoming chip design based on Intel's 18 angstrom process. The Wall Street Journal also reports that companies like Amazon and Google are making their own AI accelerators without billing themselves as competitors to NVIDIA, maybe a a choice of avoidance of that phrase. As you may recall from a previous news story we reported on, NVIDIA is trying to get ahead of the competition in the space by creating a new business unit that is aimed entirely at building custom AI chips. Sort of like a semi-custom arm of the business, but for AI. Now this story, regardless of the sort of uh, precision of the truth from the statements that are in the Wall Street Journal report, one thing that this does remind me of is the blocked acquisition of ARM by NVIDIA which you start looking at accusations like this, it's like, this is kind of what everyone was worried about with the whole buying ARM as one of the biggest effectively designed firms uh, and consuming it within NVIDIA. So uh, anyway, while much of this is unprovable, we find none of it hard to believe. It is very believable. And in recent years, NVIDIA, at least on the press side, has done better with sampling the press, even when they're overwhelmingly negative. But that's a lot different from the AI B2B relationships, uh, and it's a different group of the company entirely. So almost certainly they are aware that the rapidly developing nature of the AI industry means that the chance of getting knocked off the top at a moment's notice is much higher. The risk is higher when the industry is completely changing on a year-to-year -year basis, as opposed to something like gaming GPUs where you look at Intel's struggle to get into it, and it's clear why even at AMD as the second place incumbent can feel somewhat secure that generally speaking, there's not going to be competition. Whereas AI, uh, it's effectively a guarantee that there's going to be competition right now. Anyway, tech companies seem to have sort of grown beyond the era of monopoly busting. That, that was maybe more of a last century thing, but we wouldn't be surprised if AI is the next big industry where that talk reemerges, whether it's uh, the companies we know today are different ones. Next up, while we're on NVIDIA stories this week, NVIDIA will start adding ads to the free tier of its GeForce Now game streaming service. Uh, in an email that rolled out to GeForce Now users, NVIDIA wrote this, quote, to help provide ongoing support for the free service starting March 5th, 2024, members will experience up to two minutes of video sponsorship messages before each free gaming session while in queue. We anticipate that this change will reduce wait times for free users over time. Now, to NVIDIA's credit, free users online have reported estimated wait times over two hours. So if they need something to encourage turning on more servers or whatever they're doing, uh, then maybe that'll at least help in that capacity. And as we all know, NVIDIA is a small, struggling upstart. They can't simply afford to subsidize technologies that they don't believe in. In addition to the upcoming ads, the free tier relegates users to a basic rig, it's called, that doesn't have RTX graphics options and limits playtime to one hour sessions. The other two tiers, Priority and Ultimate, cost $10 and $20 per month respectively. Both provide different so-called rigs, playtimes, resolutions, and frame rates. Priority specifically advertises, quote, up to 60 FPS. That's a, that's a hell of an ad. It's sold instantly. And we'd have to take that to mean that basic doesn't get this decidedly bare bones requirement because it's not listed and it's apparently a, a defining feature. Now, of course, we contacted NVIDIA to ask for more context for this story, and they sent this in response. It was actually a video response. Take a look. We estimate we can sell up to 80% of an individual's visual field before inducing seizures. Moving on, GPU prices have changed. Uh, not just AMD, but NVIDIA as well. AMD is the one making more fanfare about it, though. So. Released in September of last year for an MSRP of 450 bucks, the RX 7700 XT was generally regarded as a why would you buy this class of GPU, uh, commonly known in other media outlets as the but why? That might have been us. It, it, that's like kind of a 
kind of a classic quote at this point. Anyway, AMD told us that the RX 7700 XT official price will be dropping to $420. So new $420 price, insert $420 joke here. Oh, I was supposed to, it was like a, it was. The $30 price drop brings it closer to 400 bucks, which is what we thought it should be minimally priced at when we reviewed the card as compared to the 7800 XT. The move appears to be in coordination with the global launch of the RX 7900 GRE and the NVIDIA Super Series of cards, which actually have also fallen in price despite being brand new. The RTX 4070 non-super has dropped to $550 officially, but you could actually find it online for as low as $525. You can even find the brand new 4070 super down $10 at 590 The super is for how fast the price drops after launch, but this is overall a good move or a good trend where uh, AMD and Nvidia both and Intel, to the extent we, uh, we covered them recently in the ARC revisit, are dropping prices of GPUs, finally moving in the right direction. It's really interesting to, to observe the cycles of the industry where the same thing happened in the 2017 or 18 era of that sort of crypto mining boom and bust where uh, as soon as it tapered off a little bit, there's this flood of secondhand cards to the market. You saw first party listings start dropping and plummeting in price. There was oversupply. Uh, we saw some of that with 30 series leading into now as well. And, and the 6000 series, which is why you can still buy both of them. But anyway, long time coming in the right direction for GPUs. So that's at least exciting because we're seeing it from all three of these vendors now. Up next, Sony has announced it will be laying off roughly 900 people from its workforce. And uh, this includes employees from Sony Interactive Entertainment, as well as PlayStation. And it amounts to roughly 8% of the staff. Related to all of this, the director of publishing at Larian, which made Baldur's Gate 3, tweeted to state that they've seen a surge in applications and noted that they're posting more job listings soon. In a Sony blog post, Interactive Entertainment President and CEO Jim Ryan wrote this, quote, these are incredibly talented people who have no part, oh, sorry, I misread that, have been part of our business, have been part of our success. Yes, the, the classic, they've really helped us succeed. Get out. The, the margins are, we need more money. Quote continues, we are very grateful for their contributions. However, the industry has changed immensely. Okay, and we need to future ready ourselves to set the business up for what lies ahead. We need to deliver on expectations from developers and gamers and continue to propel future technology and gaming. So we took a step back to ensure we're set up to continue bringing the best gaming experiences to the community. In an email he wrote to employees headlined, important to update regarding organizational restructuring, Ryan stated, quote, the leadership team and I made the incredibly difficult decision to restructure operations, which regrettably includes a reduction in our workforce impacting very talented individuals who have contributed to our success, end quote. These layoffs have impacted several studios globally across the Americas, EMEA, and Asia. Uh, in terms of specifics, Sony will be closing its PlayStation London studio, as we understand it entirely, which most recently developed VR games Blood and Truth and VR World. The developer was also working on an unannounced game that is presumably canceled now. Ryan also noted reductions at Fire Sprite, which most recently developed Horizon Call of the Mountain and uh, more across so-called various functions within SIE in the UK. In another Sony blog post, head of PlayStation Studios Herman Holst wrote, quote, these decisions have been very difficult, but they are necessary. In the US, Holst shared that cuts were uh, made at Insomniac Games, Naughty Dog, as well as our technology, creative and support teams. These are in addition to some smaller reductions in other teams across PlayStation Studios, he said. They also said that some projects will simply not move forward, so they're being canceled entirely. This news is very similar to what we heard regarding Microsoft's decisions with its various uh, gaming-related employees in the past weeks. This news comes hot on the heels of the PlayStation 5 failing to meet expectations because uh, for whatever reason, this is actually getting kind of frustrating to continually observe the uh, the bullshit that gets posted by these companies. But for some reason, they claim to expect infinite growth, growth and that even though everybody bought a console or a gaming PC in 2020 and 2021, when as a reminder, there was total supply shock and no one could get what they want because there was so much demand for it. Uh, some reason we expect that to continue. And it is beyond me why that continues to be the statement from all of these companies. Uh, I really don't think they, they are that 
daft. I, it just, this just seems to be the cycle. You, you over hire when things are good. And then if things go bad, eh, f them. We made our money. Anyway, the sales are down from an estimated 25 million units in 2023 downgrade to an expected 21 million units now. Uh, up next, Nintendo is suing Tropic Haze LLC, makers of the free Switch emulator Yuzu. So in this one, there's a legal complaint that Nintendo has filed where it asserts that The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom was downloaded over 1 million times before the game's official launch, with many piracy sites saying illegal copies of the game could be played specifically on Yuzu. Nintendo's lawyers have a uh, paragraph we can read. Now, we actually, from what we understand, each of the letters in this paragraph was painstakingly written by a different lawyer. They have to earn their keep somehow. There's, there's, there's a lot of them. Quote, Yuzu unlawfully circumvents the technological measures on the Nintendo Switch games and allows for the play of encrypted Nintendo Switch games on devices other than a Nintendo Switch. Yuzu does this by executing code necessary to defeat Nintendo's many technological measures associated with its games, including code that decrypts the Nintendo Switch video game files immediately before and during runtime using an illegally obtained copy of Prod.Keys keys that ordinarily are secured on the Nintendo Switch, end quote. Now, developed by the same team that made the Nintendo 3DS emulator Citra, Yuzu runs on Windows, Linux, and Android. Yuzu was even briefly seen running on Valve's own Steam Deck in video before it was pulled. Nintendo is specifically alleging that Tropic Haze uh, should be held, quote, secondarily liable for the infringement committed by the users to whom uh, Yuzu was distributed. And it is seeking, of course, equitable relief and damages, as you'd expect. Uh, emulation is a, a complicated area of law. Realistically, even if Yuzu has a case here, uh, in a lot of instances, what you see happen with these emulators and sort of uh, sometimes just side projects of people is they tend to just fold because they get steamrolled by Nintendo. And even if you could fight it, that doesn't absolve you of the cost of fighting it. Uh, and legal costs are enormous. So anyway, we'll see what happens with this one. We'll report on it depending on how it develops. Okay, if you've been following our art coverage, we have some good news for you to break up the last two stories. Uh, and you'll know that Intel has been steadily making some GPU driver improvements. We've been reporting on these for, I guess, over a year now and just did a whole video revisiting ARC for 2024. So uh, they've continued to do so. They have a new driver set that just came out. It's 31.0.101.5333. And uh, according to the company's claims, 16 games specifically will see a boost from these new drivers. The biggest asserted improvements come by the way of Just Cause 4, which sees up to a 155% average FPS uplift at 1080p medium, Assassin's Creed Syndicate with uplift up to 65% average FPS at 1080p medium again, and SnowRunner up at 49% uh, at 1080p medium. Now, the specific call out of 1080p medium doesn't mean you won't get improvements with other settings. What it means is that these are the numbers they've chosen to test and present with, uh, you're probably going to see an uplift elsewhere too. The improvements focus on DX11 overall, though, if you look at this list, which ties in with what Intel recently shared with us pertaining to its plans for this year. Arc aims to finalize the DX11 driver switchover, during which time it's rolling out a re-architected DX11 handler for Arc. After that, Intel is planning to switch to DX12 tuning for the rest of this year. And the overall recap of our recent revisit, which you should check out if you haven't seen it, because it it's pretty cool. It's interesting to test these things since they're so new. But the recap of it was uh, a, a slightly less, slightly toned down version of the prior conclusions we had, now that they've improved things, uh, which is that they are notably improved. The performance and the price are good. They, they make sense when the performance is good. Uh, the number one deterrent remains to be sort of the spotty support where despite wide sweeping or general support of games that are out there, you still run into them every now and then where it doesn't work or it doesn't work well. Uh, and th that's counter to maybe NVIDIA and AMD these days where it's a fair assumption that you buy and install any random game and it is going to work on those devices. Uh, and that's not quite there yet with Intel. However, that list of incompatibility is shrinking with each of these updates. All right, next one. Computer hardware manufacturer Dynabook Americas, uh, AKA Toshiba previously, is recalling 15 and a half million AC adapters. So if you have owned a Toshiba notebook at some point in the past, you should pay attention to the story. Or if you know someone who has owned one, uh, we've also updated our gamers.nexus hardware failure tracker to add this to the list, and there's a link 
on that site through the US CPSC report where you can get more information if you want it. Um, that's up there with the recent cable mod recall that we added to that list too. All right, so the US Consumer Product Safety Commission says that the company's laptop AC adapters can quote, overheat and spark posing burn and fire hazards. The organization notes that the company has received 679 reports of uh, what they say is AC adapters overheating or catching on fire, melting and burning leading to 43 reports of what they say are minor burn injuries. No reports of house fire were mentioned in this. However, it's definitely possible with an AC adapter failure. Of the devices, 1.3 million of the recalled adapters were sold in Canada, with the rest relegated to the US. Affected chargers were shipped with Toshiba-branded laptops, as well as one sold separately. And the filing is under Dynabook Americas after a prior rebranding and consolidation. The CPSC site has some specifics on which adapters are affected here. Um, they say they're black adapters, so that doesn't really narrow it down much. Uh, they don't give a, a specific voltage or current spec, but multiple of them because there's multiple lines of these affected. So it's not any one specific adapter. Uh, dozens of models, in fact, with varying specs are impacted here, and they were sold between 2008 and uh, April 2008 through December 2012, um, when they were manufactured, that is. Uh, and if you bought something much later, but it was manufactured within that window, you bought it in 2016, it's still going to be affected, of course. So uh, if you own a Toshiba laptop from that time, we would strongly encourage you to dig out the AC adapter, even if you're not using the device anymore, check if it's affected. They have a, a guide for how you can see if it's affected. And even if you're never going to use that thing again, just do the world a favor and uh, destroy the adapter beyond use if it is one of the affected ones. Uh, because if you donate it or leave it at a junkyard somewhere, you don't want someone picking it up and using it if it's a potential fire hazard. Uh, and there's steps to get replacements as well. So that's old hardware. It's likely it's in retirement, but uh, still usable. So it might end up with someone. All right, Geeks 3D releases Furmark 2. This was an exciting one for us. We use Furmark a lot. It's probably one of the probably have more hours in Furmark than uh, any single game over the past 15 years. But after releasing Furmark in 2007, I think it was, Geeks 3D has now released the long-awaited sequel, which is Furmark 2, Too Fur, Too Furious. For those unfamiliar with Furmark, you might recognize the fuzzy donut that it's most famous for. The venerable benchmark is a stress testing application originally designed to push your GPU to expose bad chips and memory. Historically, it's also been known as a power virus. We call it this as well. And there's a, there's a reason for this. Uh, back in the day before the GPU manufacturers started building protections into their drivers, uh, you could definitely kill parts with Furmark. And it, it also loads the VRM very heavily. So when we do stress testing for parts, one of the things we use Furmark for is specifically to, to blast the VRM and really put heavy load on the card. You can often get a, a video card like the entire board to draw more power through Furmark than most games, uh, other stress testing applications of a similar caliber, and that's because it behaves like a power virus. But for many years now, there have been drivers built uh, with protections against this so that the cards don't overheat to a point of self-destruction, in theory. Uh, and they'll do that by throttling things like clocks. So if you look at clocks of an NVIDIA card in Furmark versus a game, it's going to look way too low. That's intentional, though. It's to protect the device. Uh, anyway, it's one of the best applications for just generating heat on a video card specifically. Great for stress testing, great for thermal testing. Has some quirks. Uh, if you're going to deploy it in a, a reliable test environment, you really have to know what you're doing um, because it, it will definitely... Uh, cause problems if you're not familiar with it. But for an end user, it can be a good application. So we're excited to employ Furmark 2, Too Fast, Too Fur, or was it Too Fur, Too fur, too Furious, uh, in our upcoming testing. This was released previously in beta, and it is available officially now. It has now 64-bit Windows and Linux support. Shows you how, how dated it is. And they also noted that it has improved CLI support through Geeks Lab. And additionally, there's uh, an OpenGL and a Vulkan graphics benchmark that's supposed to output online scores. It's available for free. You can download it if you want it. Uh, but the last one is the MSI official store, now fully listing the suite of three claw handhelds, including the prices and the specs. And they're not yet available, but they've at least got the basics. So, uh, oh, and we're working on getting one for review right now. I'm uh, going to be in a, a top secret location soon. 
And uh, my understanding is that in that location, they are already available for sale. So I'm planning to go, uh, go shop and see if I can find one. But anyway, we're planning to get one in. So the initial three device listings are at $700, $750, and $800. The cheapest option, called the uh, A1M052US, uses an Intel Ultra 5135H solution that ranges from 1.2 to 4.6 gigahertz. It has 512 gigabytes of storage on a Gen 4x4 2230 SSD, 16 gigabytes of LPDDR5 6400 memory, a 1080p 7-inch screen at 120 Hz, and a comparatively large 53 watt-hour battery. So in terms of just only the watt-hour measurement, that would have it alongside the Legion Go and the Steam Deck OLED, and it also has Hall Effect joysticks and triggers. The spec lists some impressive aspects of this, but as for the core performance from the Intel solution, we're just going to have to wait and test it to let you know. The A1M051 US uses an Ultra 7 155H CPU. The clock is 200 megahertz higher on average. And then the A1M050 US, which is the most expensive, differentiates itself with a one terabyte SSD. Now we also just bought the Aya Neo Air 1S for review, and we plan to look at its Flip DS and Flip KB devices when they come to market. A ton of handouts coming out. So uh, Lenovo Legion Go has been in the lab and in testing for actually a while now, uh, but we just wrapped it all up this week and it should be getting finishing touches around when this video goes live. So you'll see that one next. Huge amount of work went into that though. Uh, really cool stuff and we're kind of iterating on and overhauling the handheld testing with each review. So it's been exciting. Okay, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching as always. Check back next week, uh, as in within the next seven days, because our case testing is coming back for ATX. And uh, we're excited for that as well. Subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to grab one of these hoodies, mod mats, coaster packs, or anything else from the store. And we'll see you all next time.